Now we're recording? Yeah. All right. So welcome. Thanks for thanks for being here tonight. This was a this was a beefy like this was a beefy uh, beefy reading. Well, lots to go over. So I'll try to keep the lecture somewhat under control, but no promises. So one thing I appreciate about the study of history, I was a, a history major, and I just still love reading history or learning about it, is it reveals how much we assume about our world to be true. Um, it, it kind of reveals how much of what we understand about our world is shaped by when and where we were born, especially once you start digging into the lives of people and how they lived and what they thought about the world. So as I've gotten further into my studies of not just the Bible, but of uh, the history around this time period, I've come to see how much like baggage I bring to the text from our culture that wasn't written. And it's been a topic I've talked about. Uh, and we'll talk about it again. So one of the things um, that's kind of reshaped how I look at the Bible and how I look at the world really is the, the categories that we kind of, we've grown up with are like natural and supernatural. So the natural world is where normal stuff, scientifically explainable stuff happens. And there's the supernatural world where like gods live and maybe like angels or demons live, depending on how you read the Bible. And sometimes the supernatural like crosses over to the natural and then it goes back to where it belongs. So that's kind of that's kind of the rough categorizing of how we mostly understand it post-enlightenment, um, which we are all children of. So these categories, however, are not the categories the ancient Israelites had. So biblical scholar and a great, um, great scholar on Genesis, if you're into that sort of thing, John Walton, talks about this in an article on BioLogos. So ancient Israelites, however, believe that God is always active in the world in numerous and often undetectable waves. They do not have the categories of natural and supernatural. The operations of the world that we consider regular and predictable that can be described in scientific ways would have, no le- would have been considered no less the work of God in the ancient world. They believed that when they planted a grain of wheat, that wheat would grow. But God would be no less involved in that if barley grew instead. So the normal predictable things that happen in life that you can, we as modern people often try to explain with without God, they would also know that if you planted wheat, we came up out of the ground, but God would still be involved, which often we want to cut that part out of it. So the more I think or try to take that worldview on and think like an ancient Israelite, that God is active in all things, even in things we understand and can explain scientifically, but that he can also show his ultimate power over all life. The more the texts, like the one we read this week, that kind of makes some sense to me or see them in new light. God can be seen moving even amongst things that we can explain if we, without um, an understanding that God is real. And we can see that in the rise and fall of kings and the fall of the kingdom of Israel. These things have like a a godly explanation, but they also have like worldly explanations um, and God's active in both. God can also be seen showing his awesome might and power in situations um, that have no discernible or easily understandable to us um, explanations, like what we see in his miraculous rescue of Judah from Syria. So we see a God at work at all the time in the world and reminding ourselves of that helps us appreciate and worship this great God even more. Uh, yeah. So we are going to start with human unfaithfulness this week as we dive into the text. So these are, if you're curious, these are all the different kings of Israel. If you lost track of them all, that's fine. Those are the ones of Judah. So we are going to start with Judah. Hmm. You get out of order? No, okay. So we're going to start with Judah. So um, 2 Kings 15 through 17 and 2 Chronicles 26 through 28, the descent of Judah, and then the final fall of Israel. So we're going to be jumping forth between Kings and Chronicles, like pretty, almost pretty much whenever I want, especially in the first and third section. And I won't normally comment where I got something from. I'll just assume you've read the text. If you have any questions or don't see where I pulled something from, Come up and talk to me later later the night. Again, we read a lot today. There's going to be a lot of summarizing tonight and not as much reflecting on random verses of poetry since there's so much to cover. So we're going to start with Judah. So the southern kingdom, like we said, is three kings during in this first section. It's Uzziah, Jotham, and Ahaz. Uzziah, confusingly enough, is also called Azariah, even in the same text. So if you got confused by that, don't worry about it. I had to Google it 
So I took a, I took a class called um, History of the Samurai in medieval Japanese literature. They just like use different names all the time with no explanation. I once read a whole book and had to go back and reread it once I realized it was one character that this book was about. It was awful and I'm still scarred by that. So Uzziah gets the good king label or Azariah, same there, which is nice. Um, and Chronicles lists his positive accomplishments that he did. And yeah, that's what Chronicles talks about. Unfortunately, the success gets to his head. So reading from 2 Chronicles 26, 16. But after Uzziah became powerful, his pride led to his downfall. He was unfaithful to the Lord his God and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. So why is this a big deal? Essentially, Uzziah attempts to seize the authority of the priests as well of that as the king. He's the king. He's not the priest. He's going against what God commanded him. So if you uh, re reference, this is what got Saul in trouble. He performed a sacrifice when he wasn't supposed to. It kind of was his downfall too. Um, some of Aaron's sons also did some improper incense burning, and they got killed on the spot for doing it. So this has been a, a problem that's cropped up through Israel's history. So the people warned Uzziah um, to no effect. And then God, I mean, kind of graciously, he doesn't kill him, but he does strike him with leprosy, which leads Uzziah to be isolated and cut off from the community for the rest of his days. It's a disappointing ending and one we have seen from kings before. We should let his story serve as a reminder to us that life is a marathon. Um, and we want to run the whole thing well. It's not the first king that's kind of tripped and stumbled at the end. Um, I think Solomon being the most obvious of them. So we should give God credit for our successes instead of bring it onto ourselves so we don't let pride go to our heads, which will often be our downfall. So then Uzziah, he's replaced by Jotham. He also is a good king and generally uh, does what is right in the Lord's eyes, which is good. So between Jotham and Uzziah, Israel is in relative peace, for almost 70 years, which I think is a, is a good thing. It's a gift from God, and I, want to rec and I want to recognize this. I've been listening to a podcast for a long time called Revolutions. It's all about the history of revolutions from the English Civil War to the Russian Revolution. It's awesome. One thing I've learned about it, though, is it's really bad to be alive during a revolution. It sounds really romantic, especially if you like the American Revolution. And if you're a normal person, like all of us, it's horrible for the most part to, to, to not be in a, in a nation that's turning it all over. So I've, when I was reading this, I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know what? Things were good during them. We'll get, let's give credit to that. Jotham, however, he does have his own negatives. He takes no st steps to stamp out the people's idolatry with the Asherah poles. This has been going on for a long time. Um, it's clear that you can be a good thing, a good king and not do this, as him and Uzziah did it. But it's also, um, it's kind of a problem. It's this lower level sin. It's kind of been operating in the background in Judah for a while now. And when you let these lower, you know, lower level sins in your life, they can sometimes fester and explode to be a really big deal. Which is what happens next in the next king of Judah, Ahaz. So he starts following the balls. He desecrates the temple. He goes so far to sacrifice children, which is really bad. Uh, yeah, this is what God, I don't know what I'll say about it. This is what God hated about the Canaanites, why the Israelites came to kill, kick the Canaanites out of their land. Because this was their religious practice. They would sacrifice children to their gods. Not good stuff. So God, even with all this going on, he still looks out for the people of Judah. You get a nice story about that in 2 Chronicles 28 that we're just not going to talk about, but it's there. But calamity after calamity starts to happen to Judah. And as God tries to wake Ahaz up to the consequences of his own actions, he's turning away from God. Negative things keep happening. God trying to give his attention. Unfortunately, Ahaz only continues to fall deeper and deeper into sin and idol worship, looking for a God who he could love and serve, and he is unable to find one. Ahaz's story kind of makes me sad. Is it, I'm, I reflect, and I've seen people who keep having bad things happen in their life, and they just bounce from idol to idol to idol, looking for something to fill the God-shaped hole in their heart, but just can't seem to find it. So this is where we leave Judah. Things are starting to spiral, particularly during the time of Ahaz. But it's still much better than what's going on in the northern tribes. So Israel in our study, which has gone over for hundreds of years, has had zero good kings, not a one who has really loved the Lord. And we see the fruit of the hundreds of years of choosing things other than the Lord. Kind of all comes to head. 
it's complete chaos and instability at the top of Israel. We get one king who ruled for two years. We get one ring king ruled for six months. We get one king who ruled for one month. And almost all the kings, see the little like blood signs here? That means they died while in office. So um, it's always a bad sign when you have to kill the person you took over to take over power. That's just not like a good, that's not a good way to set up a political system if you're ever in that position to set it up in the future. So um, Dr. Hannah put together a quote that kind of keeps it straight. Civil stability is a gift from God and instability offers evidence of eternal decay. In the Northern Kingdom, Zechariah was assassinated by Shelem, Shelem by Menahem, who destroyed a city for rejecting his kingship. Pekah by Pekiah, and Pekiah by Hosea. Yeah, everyone's killing everybody. So Dr. Hannah mentions this, but I won't repeat it. There's one guy who gets to pass his rulership onto his son, and it's Menahem. And all he had to do was sack an entire city of Israelites. I think the description was ripped open to pregnant women. Yeah, he had to rule by absolute fear and terror. That was the only way to get things done in Israel at this time. And political chaos, it stirs up a lot of crap at the top of society. And unfortunately, all of that rolls downhill. A thriving society needs stable leadership at the top, and Israel had none of it. So during this time period, we get these stories of the Assyrians encroaching on Israelite territory. They're sacking and conquering cities, and they're subjugating the Israelites to be this vassal state. Um, they're they're semi-autonomous, but they have to pay these heavy taxes um, to the Assyrians, just for the pleasure of the Assyrians not coming to fully conquer your territory and scatter everyone elsewhere. So instead of recognizing their weakness, they're now at like their ultimate breaking point. They could, and they have this God, Yahweh, who would save them, but they, they, they don't want to do it. First, they try to appease the Assyrians. They pay the tax. When that burden is too much, the Israelites make an alliance with Egypt, Hosea, and they rebel against the Assyrians. Eventually, the Assyrians find out that Hosea did this, and they come and conquer Israel once and for all. They destroy all the idols and like Dan and Beersheba. They destroy everything. They smash all the astral poles. They're showing how worthless these gods of wood and stone are. And as was policy throughout the entire Assyrian Empire, the Assyrians scatter the ten tribes of Israel throughout their kingdom through empire. Um, most of the Israelites who left would have been slaves, unless they could have been really useful, but they were most likely just labor. And the Assyrian policy was to bring different people in to settle this good land who would be loyal to the Assyrians. And they kind of like made sure to bring different ethnic groups together, mix them together. So there was be no like locus of power to rebel against Assyria. It's a brutally effective tactic um, that future empires such as the Babylonians are going to pick up on. So we get this interesting passage at the end of 2 Kings 17 about these people who will settle in Israel, and they're referred to as the Samaritans. So yeah, they were Maj Podge, different people groups, who they kind of, a Syrian king, some in the area. Um, they end up adopting Yahweh, not as the ruler of the universe, but as kind of the local god of the land, among all their other local gods, which, you know, which would have been a lot of them, that they brought in. So um, we could do a whole lecture on Samaritans. It's interesting, but yeah, don't have time. This history is why during Jesus' time, though, that the Samaritans were looked down upon. Um, if you've read, you know, the Good Samaritan is a very fa famous story. There's Jesus meeting the woman of Samaritan descent at the well. And um, this is why all this backstory, all this baggage is why all those Samaritan stories of Jesus's time were so scandalous and shocking that Jesus would want to include these people in his kingdom or those people. So back to the kingdom of Israel. We have seen them descend more and more into chaos and away from God throughout this study. And finally, it reaches its inevitable conclusion, destruction and exile from the promised land. So why did this happen? Did it happen because a smaller kingdom went through a turbulent political time and then made a series of poor alliance choices, which enraged the big bad empire to finally conquer them and be done with it? Yes, the Bible gives us that picture of what happens too. But the author of Kings also wants to make clear that Israel fell because they had willfully chosen to remove themselves from God's presence. And God is a live and active participant in his world. Reading here from 2 Kings 17, 21 through 23. 
when he tore away, when he tore Israel away from the house of David, they made Jeroboam son of Nebat their king. It's the first king of Israel. Jeroboam enticed Israel away from following the Lord, caused them to commit a great sin. Israel, the Israelites persisted in all the sins of Jeroboam and did not turn away from them until the Lord removed them from his presence, as he had warned through all his servants, the prophets. So the people of Israel were taken from their homeland into exile in Assyria. A biblical understanding of what happens to Assyria puts emphasis, or the Israel, puts emphasis on both the human actions that cause all this, but also God's actions and the covenant and God removing his presence from them. It doesn't try to separate them into different things. They're one and the same. And this leads me to my first principle for the night. Loving idols and rejecting God leads to separation from him. We can count on this truth like we can count on gravity when you throw something into the air. If you love idols, you will worship them and not God. And God demands your full love and worship. If you don't love God, then you will be separated from his presence. Separating yourself from the creator of the universe, the sustainer of life, the being whose very nature of love, it will have disastrous consequences. God brings order goodness, and thriving. Separation from God brings disappointment, evil, chaos. This will play out in ways that we can mostly explain, understand, without acknowledging God's existence and presence in the world, but to get to a complete picture of what is happening, what happened to Israel, we need to recognize God's role in our world. All right, so that was just one section, guys. We got two more to go. So we're going to try something a little different. We didn't do an icebreaker up top because we're going to do it now and give everybody a brain break because we're going to do a hard switch. So find somebody and ask what is, and talk about what is your favorite Disney movie and why. And then we'll be back to talk Chronicles about it. Chronicles 29 through 31. So we're now taking a hard shift, kind of saying goodbye to Israel for now, really focusing on Judah. So Judah was on the same path as Israel, particularly when Ahaz was in charge. But then a new king takes over and actually partners with God, which leads to flourishing. So let's spend, we're going to spend our next two sections talking about that king, Hezekiah. Section two tonight, 2 Chronicles 29 through 31, Hezekiah's restoration of the temple and Judah. It was interesting to me that Hezekiah is Ahaz's son. Um, we have no reason to think that his earthly father taught him anything about following God. And yet Hezekiah clearly knows and loves the Lord. So just was like a reminder of your parents. Our parents all have big influences on us, but your parents and their choices are not, our de- are not your destiny, not our destiny. You can do something different, which Hezekiah does. And when he takes over, there's a lot of political instability. His father just kept losing wars and territories, money to other nations. So instead of following Israel's lead and trying to get Egypt to be a different big bad to come scare away Assyria, um, Hezekiah knows where his true strength lies, and that strength is in the Lord. And he knows that before he embarks on any of the other myriad projects that he has to do to restore the fortunes of Judah, like the whatever the thing they were doing with like blocking the water that brought a bunch of money that I didn't understand. He's got other things he wants to do, but he knows first he has to get right with God. So right at the beginning of his reign, the first month of the first year, Hezekiah goes about restoring the temple that his father had desecrated. So he does so in a way that doesn't try to usurp the power like his ancestor Uzziah or Saul or somebody else did. But he instead, he brings the Levites back, the priests. He puts them into their proper role. So you can show you that you have a heart for God by doing things his way, especially when he's given explicit instructions like he had around the temple. But we're going to put an asterisk on that statement too. So Hezekiah and the Levites, they go around restoring the sacred space, the temple, and making sure the temple is set apart, it's holy, consecrated. Then they embark on this long ritual to inaugurate the temple or re-inaugurate it. It's kind of like how a business has changed ownership um, after a particularly turbulent time. They do a grand reopening, and it's like, now under new ownership, um, to show that the bad times are in the past, and it's time for the good times again. There's a lot of similarities between what Hezekiah did um, and the priests do during with all the sacrificing of the animals and the waiting seven days and sacrificing of like 
even more animals. Um, it's very similar to what Solomon did when he originally inaugurated the temple, which we talked about in the first People of the Promised Land study. So this is an act of re really of recreation, of restoration um, by Hezekiah, or Hezekiah gets to be God's hand and, hands and feet in this project. I especially like the details given. They bust it out of the instruments. They sing the songs of David and Asaph, um, presumably many of them being the Psalms that we still find in our Bible. God is worthy of our worship. One of the most powerful ways we can do that is through making music. So once the temple, temple has been sanctified as holy, once again, Hezekiah invites the people of God to come to Jerusalem and celebrate Passover. Crucially, he invites all of God's people. He invites everybody from Israel, from Beersheba, which is like this, it says from Beersheba, which is the southernmost city in Judah, to Dan, which is the northernmost city in Israel. So from Beersheba to Dan basically means all of Israel. This is a big risk by Hezekiah. In this point in the story, because we're kind of just like jumping back and forth in time, Israel has not yet fallen to Assyria. They're still around when Hezekiah does this. And um, although that for not too long, relations between the nations have been poor for generations. We've read about all of that and slowly getting worse. And Hezekiah's father, uh, Ahaz, had even suffered a crippling defeat at the hands of the Israelites um, not that long ago. Hezekiah, however, he trusts in the Lord. And he has the bigger picture in mind. Hezekiah knows that our God is a God of unity, of restoration, of bringing all of his people together to celebrate his goodness and his kingdom, no matter if his people are going through earthly squabbles, like unfortunately so often happens. So we're told not everybody ends up listening to this. Plenty of people from the Northern Kingdom, they end up returning to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. This, however, it presents another problem. As many people, particularly from the Northern Kingdoms, they're not ready for Passover. So they are considered what is ritually unclean. Um, this doesn't, this is, unclean does not mean sinful, but um, when you're unclean, it means you've kind of come into contact with something associated with death. And there was a process that needed to be undertaken before you could enter God's space again. Um, that's the one sentence version of the book of Leviticus. So Hezekiah invites these people from the Northern Kingdom and they need, they desperately need God's presence, but they are not able to enter it. What is he to do? There's also one other detail about this Passover that makes it wrong. It's the wrong month. Passover is supposed to take place in the first month of the Hebrew calendar. But this is the second month. He just spent the whole last month like rededicating, you know, restoring the temple. There was a few exceptions given in the Mosaic law for how would you celebrate the Passover later, but it was for like one person. It was not for the entire nation, everybody doing it. So Hezekiah, depending on how you want to look at it, he's doing the same thing Uzziah did. He's changing how Passover is supposed to be done from how God instructed it to be done. And yet, we know from this passage that Hezekiah's Passover is this huge success, even though he doesn't follow the rules. So what gives? How are we supposed to understand what takes place here? I think Hezekiah's Passover is this perfect example of what we mean when we say the Bible is wisdom literature. As humans, we could not read a handbook, a manual on what to do in every single situation every single time. It would be horrifically boring. And there are simply too many situations that pop up in life that just are either the first time for things or different contexts. Yeah, so all these stories that were given in the Bible, they are, all the details were given, they're meant us to shape us into people who know and trust God and who can discern his will and the Spirit's will in any given situation. Sometimes it's clear what you're supposed to do. You don't really need to make any fuzzy arguments. God says, don't commit adultery. I've never heard of adultery actually being the right thing to do, and I would question it if I did. But sometimes doing God's will means going against what you think you should do, even if you have some biblical support for what you mean, which kind of makes this confusing, which is why we want the Bible to shape us into people who can discern God's spirit. And this, this is what Hezekiah does. He knows God doesn't want to have a Passover in a desecrated temple. 
So he spent the first month when he's supposed to be having Passover. It's like, we're going to fix the temple instead. He knows that God still wants people to celebrate Passover. So for this time and place, you know what? We're going to delay it for a month. He knows that God cares about all his people. So he invites everybody, no matter the political risk. And even better, Hezekiah takes steps and literally changes what you're supposed to do with Passover to ensure everybody gets to participate in this one. He appeals to God. He acts as their intercessor, which set off your Jesus alarm bells, that kind of language right there. And this story is a big part of the mosaic that helps us understand what kind of savior we need and why Jesus fits that mold. So let's read from 2 Chronicles 30, 17 through 20. Since many in the crowd had not consecrated themselves, the Levites had to kill the Passover lambs for all those who were not ceremonially clean and could not consecrate their lambs to the Lord, which is what you're supposed to do. Consecrate your lamb, paint the, put the blood over. Although most of the many people who came from Ephraim, Manasseh, Issachar, and Zebulun, these are all northern kingdom tribes, had not purified themselves, yet they ate the Passover contrary to what was written. But Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, May the Lord who is good pardon everyone who sets their heart on seeking God, the Lord, the God of their ancestors, even if they are not clean according to the rule of the sanctuary. And the Lord heard Hezekiah and healed the people. I love that the Bible includes a part of the story that says contrary to what was written. Because that just like blows all your categories or a lot of people's categories of what, what is the Bible actually about. It's reminding us that the point of all these rules in the Old Testament is not so everyone at, in all times and all situations follows rules perfectly. It is meant to shape us, which is just hard since we're thousands of years removed from their culture. Anyways, I, I, as you can tell, I love this story. I thought it was amazing. And I find it so applicable to how we're supposed to take what we read and apply it to our life because Hezekiah is doing the same thing. First, I think it shows we should have a heart for including people who are earnestly seeking God. And while you don't want to throw everything out for people like that, it's clear that God is willing to meet people where they are at. If you're going to do things in a way that seem counterintuitive, or they might even go directly against what people understand what God is to be saying, like Hezekiah did, I would say if you do it on the side of including more people and bringing them to meet God, to encounter God, um, then you're probably following the right track. And if, But if you're doing it in a way that makes you the center and the focus, like Uzziah did, then you're definitely doing it wrong and you're trying to steal God's authority. Because the changes to the rules, Hezekiah just keeps doing them. The Passover lasts for seven days, which is you're not supposed to do that. And yet this is counted as a good thing. The people of God, they're finally back together. They're finally experiencing what it's like to experience God in his community, of his people, and celebration and worship. It's time to party. And that's what they do, even if the party breaks the strictest interpretation of God's rules. This is a perfect example of what we mean by say God judges the heart. He knows Hezekiah's heart. He knows that Hezekiah wants to help bring the people back together in unity, worshiping God. He knows the people from the northern tribes have been lost for generations. These are not people who are going to know or understand the law or anything very well at this point. They don't really know what's going on. They just need to experience and encounter the love of God. There will be time to figure out what to do, the stricter interpretation of the rules. It's not like he changed Passover forever because of this one time. But in this time and place, God's spirit was moving people to do something different. And Hezekiah was a man steeped enough in the wisdom of God's word to recognize, hey, we need to do something different this time to include people. After all this is done, you can tell it works because the people leave changed. And they finally go destroy the Asherah poles, which had been plaguing the people of Judah for generations. They start bringing tithes. They start generously giving to the Levites. And they start acting more like the kingdom of priests that they are supposed to be. I think we can learn lessons from this story on how to reach people who are lost but are seeking. I feel like we see people like this and we can see their Asherah pole. I can see what your idol worship is. And we want them, hey, go smash your idol and then come meet God. But this is, that tells us this is wrong. Instead, we should bring the people together, eager but still flawed, 
still broken, and we should have them encounter the living God and a community of believers. We have Jesus acting as our intercessor at all times. And then we can watch them be changed to the people who want to go smash the Asherah poles, who want to go destroy their idols. And we need the Holy Spirit's power in our lives to fight idols. And God is willing to work with people who have a heart for him. So let us be willing as people to bring people as they are to meet God and let God do the convicting of changing of heart that needs to be done, like what we see here. My second principle for the night is leading others to know God and worship him is a supreme privilege. God called Hezekiah to be his hands and feet, and the king rose to the occasion. And what a blessing that was for all people that he did this. But it was also a blessing for Hezekiah as well. He's king over a godly people who are, you know, really being fruitful and multiplying. God can raise children of Abraham from stones. The New Testament tells us that. So we should be thankful that he wants to work with us and recognize the privilege when it does happen. We should all try to emulate Hezekiah's wisdom and heart for others and not, and not become Pharisees, way too bogged down in the technical rules when there's someone out there who needs to be loved and reached. So my final section for tonight is section three, God's deliverance of Judah, 2 Kings 18 through 20, 2 Chronicles 32. It kind of kicks off another golden era for Judah. Hezekiah has peace on his borders for a long time after, uh, after his kind of scandalous Passover. But in the 14th year of his reign, Assyria, big bad Assyria, comes to Nakin. They are an empire looking to claim more land for their own, as empires want to do. Even faithful followers of God will go through trials and tribulations, and this is Hezekiah's. Random, if you want to learn more about the Assyrian Empire, listen to a podcast called Tides of History. They just did a series on the Assyrian Empire. It was really cool. I guess if you're a nerd. Anyways, back to our story. In the 14th year of Hezekiah's reign, Assyria comes and starts They conquer all the fortified cities of Judah, which leaves Jerusalem vulnerable for attack. There's no forts to protect anymore. So Hezekiah, he tries to appease them with tribute money, but you know appeasement doesn't work. We've already seen that with Israel. So then the commander of this Assyrian army comes back and he threatens death upon the people of Judah unless they completely surrender to him. He even threatens to make the people drink their own urine and eat their own excrement, as the Bible says so politely, which what wonderful people the Assyrians are. So the Assyrians have, after all, already conquered and dispersed the northern tribe by this point. So the people of Judah know that the field commander can make good on this threat. They've already done it to their fellow you know, their fellow Hebrews. The people, however, they don't respond to the commander. And um, yeah, God is their rock and he's their firm foundation. And then when a group of people all know that and can all work together and act, uh, they're capable of standing up to all powers and principalities. It's pretty cool. Hezekiah gets this news. He's very upset, which is understandable. And he takes the time to kind of properly grieve his feelings. It's natural to feel like being a faithful follower of God should make your life easier. Like, hey, I don't want to go through this. This is going to be awful. But we still face trials and tribulations like anyone else. We should let ourselves feel all the difficult feelings that come up when those happen so we can work through them. Not try to just bury them and stuff them away. Hezekiah's faith, however, it's still strong in this moment. He cries out to God in distress, and he knows that God is going to preserve a remnant no matter what. He says so. But he appeals to Isaiah. For guidance and deliverance from God. Hey, Isaiah, you've probably heard that name before, like on all the Christmas Eve services. Welcome to the narrative. We'll, we'll talk about him more later, but he's a prophet. So God talks to Isaiah. He tells Hezekiah, um, you know what? I'm going to deliver the people from this. Thanks for coming, appealing out to me. And what do you know? It comes to pass. It comes through in a situation that looks really ordinary, really natural, so to speak. Um, the field commander, he gets news. King's way, he goes to be with the king, and then he dies, just kind of randomly. So if you have eyes to see, however, you can see God was working through this. He told Hezekiah it was going to happen. It happened. The king of Assyria, however, he gets word that all of this happened. And he doesn't want the people of Judah to think they were actually saved. Nope, random coincidence. Just kidding. The people of Judah, now you're going to fall to Assyria, just like all the other smaller nations did. 
So here comes another Assyrian army, this time with the king of Assyria at the head, not just his general. Again, Hezekiah turns to the Lord in the distress. We get the scene of him entering the temple and completely surrendering over to God. He knows he cannot defeat this king of Assyria, but he knows who can. And again, God delivers. Again, Isaiah prophesies victory for Judah and defeat for Assyria. And again, it happens. This time, however, it's spectacular. The angel of the Lord goes out at night and puts to death an entire Assyrian army. The king, understandably panicked, he runs and returns to Nineveh, where he will eventually be killed by two of his sons. No matter human empire, no matter how strong or terrifying, can stand up to God. So now when people use the word supernatural, take it all the way back to the beginning, this is normally the type of the event they are referring to, the one where an angel comes and puts together to death an entire army in one night. So let's take the opportunity to try and think through this situation without using our modern categories. So we considered a sign and a wonder from God, a show of God's awesome, incredible might and power. God, after all, is the creator and sustainer of all life. And as so, he can choose to remove that life, his very breath, from us dirt creatures, according to the Bible. That's kind of terrifying to think about it that way. At least for me, it's given me a healthy and proper fear of the Lord, knowing he could take it away at any point. But God choosing to end life is not something beyond nature, because without God, there is no nature. There is no natural. So we should use this story to celebrate God and his awesome power. And i am become more thankful to God that he is a source of all life and has given it to me, um, a flawed human being, and has not taken it away. So if all this business with Assyria wasn't enough, while all this was going on, Hezekiah gets really sick um, and finds out, basically gets his like last rites from Isaiah. You know, when it rains, when it rains, it pours, or bad things come in threes. I guess that, that fits here. So once again, Hezekiah, he cries out to the Lord in anguish. He doesn't explicitly ask God for more time. He just is heartbroken and bitter and that he asks for God to remember him. God knows Hezekiah's heart. He knows the true essence of what Hezekiah wants in his prayer. So he gives it to him. He gives the king more time. It's a wonderful, positive example um, of how God is the giver of life, full of awesome power and wonder. To me, it was also a reminder, God still cares about us as individuals and what is going on, even when there is big, world-shattering stuff happening on all around us. We all know what it's like to live through big, world-shattering things happening all around us. And at least for me, sometimes when those happen, it feels like, why would God care about me? I am just one little dirt creature. But none of the problems are too small for God. The story reminds us they aren't. So Hezekiah, up to this point, he's been remarkable. He's been flawless. He's basically been perfect. Unfortunately, we know he is not perfect. And his story ends with the pride getting the better of him, just like it did to Uzziah. So the Babylonians, they find out, hey, Hezekiah recovered from his illness. He's been spared against the Assyrians twice. I want to meet this king. This is remarkable. Hezekiah, he has this opportunity to make it about God instead he makes it about Hezekiah. He shows off all this wealth that he has gained during the time of the king. He's hiding nothing from the Babylonians. He's acting like the big man now. He's feeling full of pride like he did. Isaiah warns Hezekiah that he has now laid the seeds for the future downfall of Judah with his pride. We see this warning, and we're laying on the plane here, the end of chapter 20 in 2 Kings. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. The time will surely come when everything in your palace, all that your predecessors have stored up until this day, will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, who will be born to you, will be taken away. They will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. The word of the Lord you have spoken is good, Hezekiah replied. For he thought, will there not be peace and security in my lifetime? Ugh. This is a sad ending for an otherwise remarkable king. He's become more focused on himself here at the end and having peace and security for himself in his own time than he is on the overall health of God's people. Peace and security, we talked about, it is a gift from God. Um, but when we prioritize our own comfort 
our own peace, our own security over everything else, we start to slip and fall away from God like Hezekiah does. So here, this is Hezekiah struggling with pride. He's taking credit for what God has done. And he becomes too enamored with his own personal comforts over else over what else is going on. Ugh, that hits a little too close to home for me personally. So it's in the, disappointing that Hezekiah's story ends on such a sour note after such a godly life. But it's a good reminder that even the best of us fall remarkably short of Jesus. It's why we need Jesus, why we put our hope and trust in God's son. Hezekiah is a good example. He's part of the portrait, the mosaic of what a savior is going to look like. But he's not a complete picture. Thankfully, Jesus laid down all his own comforts at the foot of the cross. Our final principle for tonight is every challenge you face presents an opportunity to seek and trust God. Sometimes the challenges, they seem big and insurmountable, like this unstoppable army at the footstep of your kingdom. Other times, the challenges are more mundane, small and subtle, like I'm going to take credit for something that God did, even though I'm feeling pretty good about it. Yeah, I think I'm going to do that. All these challenges, however, give us chances to draw closer and nearer to God, trusting him more and more each day with all of our lives. Let's close in prayer. Dearly Father, I thank you. Thank you for all, everyone here who wants to study and learn more about your word and grow closer to you. And just pray that you would be with the discussion group tonight. Your sons are here to pray. Amen.